So we're going to talk about fluid and electrolytes, balance and disturbances, chapter 13. So the fluid and electrolyte balances is necessary for life and homeostasis. Nursing role anticipates and identify and responds to the possible imbalances. The fluid and electrolytes is, accounts for approximately 60% of typical adult body fluids. It varies in ages and body size. Gender. The extracellular fluid is two thirds of the body fluids. Skeletal muscle mass is accounted for that. And extracellular fluid, extra, uh, extravascular plasma, erythrocytes, leukocytes, thrombocytes, interstitial and lymphs are also included in the extracellular. Transcellular includes uh, cerebral spinal fluid, pericardial fluid, and synovial fluid. So some of the fluids that we will be talking about is intracellular and extracellular. And remember, when we're talking about a CBC and a renal panel, when we're talking about the CBC and the renal panel, um, the fluids that you will see on your labs is extracellular. So that's the fluids that's seen on the outside of the cells. So if you had um, a renal panel and you was checking the potassium and you know the regular levels for potassium is 3.5 to 4.5, remember that is something that we're testing the extracellular fluids. Electrolytes. Electrolytes includes active chemicals that carry positive cations and negative anions and electrical charges. Major Cations is your sodium, your potassium, calcium, magnesium, and hydrogen ions. Major anions are chloride, bicarbonate, phosphate, sulfate, um, and proyanate ions. It's expressed in terms of milliequivalence or MEQ. And a lot of that you will see when we're talking about potassiums, you will see that the doses are MEQ. So potassium, milliequivalents of. Electrolyte concentrations differ in fluids and the different compartments. The regulations of fluids, number one. Movement of fluid through capillary walls depends on the hydrostatic pressure. It's exerted on walls of blood vessels. Osmotic pressure is exerted by protein in the plasma. Directions of fluid movement depends on the difference of hydrostatic and osmotic pressure. Regulation of fluid, number two. Osmosis is the area of low solute concentrations to the areas of a high solute concentration. Diffusion is solutes move from an area of higher concentration to a lower concentration. So that's the difference between osmosis and diffusion. Filtration movement of water Solutes occurs from areas of high hydrostatic pressure to an area of a low hydrostatic pressure. Active transport is the sodium potassium pump. Maintains higher concentration in the extracellular sodium and intracellular sodium. That's why if a patient has a um, sodium level that is extremely high, like 156, you know that patient is probably dry and uh, we want to try to give them some fluids. If a patient who has a sodium of about uh, 112, we call that hyponatremia. We would like to try to restrict that patient's fluids because of the sodium pot potassium pump inhibitor. So we don't want patients to get too much water and then it moves out into, uh, from inside the cells to the outside of the cells and causes the cells to shrink. Routes, gains, and losses. The gain. Healthy people gain fluids by drinking and eating. Daily intake and output of water are equal. Losses. Kidney. Urine output. 1 ml per kilogram per hour. And I know most of you guys are taught that a patient should put out about 30 cc's an hour of urine per the time. So if a patient is on an eight hour shift, we would expect that at least their output should be at least 240 mLs. 
if they're only 12 hours minimum, they should put out about 360. If a patient does not put out about that much urine, we call that oliguria. And so that's the term I would like for you all to use. And we'll call the physician and we'll say, hey, you know, this patient is putting out less than the required amount of urine or of urine, or we think this patient is having some oliguria. They may be experiencing some dehydration. So you wanna make sure that you notify the physician. Skin loss, sensible due to sweating and insensible due to fever, exercise, and burns. That's why if a patient um, is out running in the heat, we like for them to try to hydrate before they decide they're gonna start running. And um, if a patient is uh, have burns, we want to make sure that that patient is uh, given the fluids, the right fluids, uh, in, in equivalence to whatever, may, whatever they may be experiencing. And a lot of times, we want to give them something like the lactated ringers. Lungs, 300 mLs every day, greater with increase for respiration. So if you have a patient who's breathing very fast, we call that tachypnea. If they're breathing very fast, they're putting out a lot of uh, water, believe it or not. GI tract, large losses are due to uh, nausea and vomiting. So if you have a patient who's leave, losing a lot of fluids based off of uh, vomiting or diarrhea, then you want to make sure that you really carefully look at the kidney functions and or look at the intake and the output for this patient. Gerontological considerations. We have to make sure that the patients who are of the elderly population is getting the right amount of fluids. Uh, clinical manifestations of imbalance may be subtle to these patients. Fluid deficit may cause the patients to become delirious. They may experience delirium. Decreased cardiac reserve may cause the patients, um, it could be a side effects of the patients losing volume. Reduced renal functions. Patients get older, they have a higher creatinine level, um, and that may become an issue. Dehydration is very common in the gerontological population because they don't drink much, they don't eat much, they don't really have an appetite, or maybe their taste buds are not like they used to be. Age-related thinning of the skin and loss of strength and elasticity. Um, so when you're doing an assessment of a patient, one thing that we, or you may learn in the lab with Ms. Scott and Mr. Collins is, that you wanna check your patient's skin tugger. Fluid volume imbalances. The fluid volume deficit, uh, FVD is also, named as high, is also known as hypovolemia. Fluid volume excess is also, named as hyper, also known as hypervolemia. If you have a patient who has fluid volume deficit, that patient may be dry. Um, the skin tugger may be slow to respond as well. If they have an excess, they have, may have tight um, skin. You may even see the patient having something called third spacing. And that's when you see a lot of extra fluids sitting outside of the patient's skin and they may have a decrease in urine. So if you have a patient who has um, a lot of fluid on the outside of the skin but not putting a lot of output out, sometimes the physician may order a medication called albumin. And that is a very high sodium so uh, concentration, so remember that we talked about a sodium phosphate pump. So if that patient is having a problem with their sodium levels, then we give them, with the water level, we give them a high sodium because the fluid is sitting out in the uh, extracellular tissues and we wanna pull it back into the intracellular tissues so, so that it can go through the uh, kidney fun kidneys and regulate it and help to hydrate the body. So sometimes even if a patient looks very uh, like they're full of liquids or, or third spacing does not always mean that they're very well hydrated. They could very much be dehydrated. Fluid volume deficit. The fluid volume deficit may occur alone in a combination with other imbalances. Loss of extracellular fluid um, exceeds intake ratio of water. Electrolytes lost in the same proportion as they exist in the normal body fluids. So how do we measure this as a nurse? We measure this by using a test called a renal panel or a basic metabolic panel or a comprehensive metabolic panel. And a lot of times you will find in that panel, uh, you will find sodium, potassium, chloride, 
Those are some of the things that you will find in your basic metabolic panel, comprehensive panel, renal panel, Chem 7s, Chem 14s, they're all are the same. It just depends on where you were educated or what resource you're actually using. Dehydration, not the same as FVD, fluid volume deficit, loss of, loss of water along with increased the serum sodium level. So remember, I talked about if a patient have an increase in their sodium, they will be denoted as being dehydrated. So if you have a patient who has a sodium level of 156, then that patient may be dehydrated. So make sure that you pay attention to your basic metabolic panel or your comprehensive metabolic panel that denotes, hey, this patient may be dehydrated. Causes of fluid volume deficit. Abnormal fluid, fluid losses can be through vomiting, diarrhea, sweating, and GI suctioning. So those things we've talked about, things that um, when we get to the GI tract, we'll talk about patients who have disease processes that may cause them to have um, vomiting or diarrhea. And with the COVID-19, some of the side effects that people are talking about they're having is uh, loss of uh, fluid through their bowel. So those patients are going to lose a lot of fluids and become hypervolemic. And from hypervolemia, they start having other problems. So decreased intake, maybe the patient is nauseated so they're not taking in a lot of fluids. And some of the things that you may see, especially in the pediatric population, that we may refer the patient to uh, something called the Johns Hopkins rehydration formula. And sometimes what happens is we give a patient just a small cup, about 30 cc's of fluids. And we do this about every five to 10 minutes trying to rehydrate the patient. Or you may just see that the patient may get a bolus of some type of um, IV fluids. Third space, fluid shifts. And these are some of the things that I was just talking about. And the slide says it could be related to burns um, and ascites. So if a patient has burns and they have a um, problem with homeostasis or a problem with fluid shift, and that's what you see a lot of in burn patients, you may see that the patient is experiencing third spacing. If a patient has problems with their albumin levels, you will see that they have some third spacing. If your patient have problems with liver dysfunctions, you will see that the patient has some problems with third spacing. So additional causes can be diabetes insipidus. Um, diabetes insipidus causes the patients to put out a large volume of urine. So if you have a patient who has diabetes insipidus, it also relates to something called SIADH. And um, that correlates with diabetes insipidus. And what happens is the patient puts out a large volume of urine, causing the patient to become dehydrated. Adrenal insufficiencies are hemorrhaging. If a patient is losing large volumes of blood, of course, they will have a volume depletion. Please remember that when we're trying to replace fluids of patients who have had uh, large volume injuries with uh, blood loss, we want to make sure that we can get some of the uh, blood replaced back into the patient's body by using blood. Um, if a patient is using blood, losing blood, we want to make sure that we can replace it with blood. And if a patient has some type of religious or cultural beliefs that would prohibit care while they're here and getting blood, sometimes we may also use an artificial volume expander called dextran. Dextran is something that you may see in emergency cases when we need to increase the volume of a patient. And of course, you might see a patient getting normal saline. That's what you guys are used to. If a patient is a surgical patient, you might see them using lactated ringers. If the patient has had burns, that might be a choice is lactated ringers. The clinical manifestation of fluid volume deficit, the patient can develop rapidly. They can become dehydrated rapidly if the patient is losing large volumes of fluids. Um, severity depends on the degree of loss. Uh, see table 13-4 in your book, Clinical Signs and Symptoms and Laboratory Findings. And remember I talked about on the first day of class that some of the laboratory findings that you all may need to be very familiar with is the Comprehensive Metabolic Panel, 
or the basic metabolic panel, also renal panel. Fluid volume deficit, the nursing management. Of course, you want to make sure that we um, are measuring strict intake and output at least every eight hours and sometimes hourly. It depends on the deficiency of the patient. Daily weight loss, vital signs. We want to monitor them very closely. Skin and tongue tugger. Um, I talked about the skin tugger earlier. The mucosa, looking at the patient's urine output, is the patient putting out at least 30 cc's an hour? The mental status, is the patient confused? Do they have some signs and symptoms of delirium? Measure the minimized fluid loss. Uh, administration of oral fluids, so giving the patient some oral fluids, and that will revert back to um, the Johns Hopkins uh, oral rehydration formula that you may find in the hospitals that they may use. Administration of uh, administration of parental fluids, such as lactated ringers, uh, such as normal saline. A lot of times, if a patient is dry, you may see them get a bolus of lactated ringers uh, or normal saline, excuse me. But make sure that if a patient has sedentary lifestyles or pre-existing injuries, such as, or pre-existing diseases, such as congestive heart failure, you have to make sure that you're very mindful of how much fluids that you're giving that patient. Fluid volume excess will be the next topic that we talk about. So fluid volume excess is an isotonic expansion of the ECF caused by the abnormal retention of water and sodium in approximately the same proportion in which the normal exists in the ECF, secondary to an increase in the total body of sodium. FVE due to fluid volume overload or diminished or homeostatic mechanisms, which are heart failure, uh, kidney failure, cirrhosis of the liver, um, contributing factors or consumptions of excessive amounts of table salt or other sodium salts. Um, excessive administration of sodium containing fluids. That's why we need to make sure that we teach our patients about good dieting and good health because things that's in canned goods um, is high in sodium and it's not always good for the patients. And that's one thing about nursing um, that you guys would need to make sure that you do as you need to make sure that you teach your patients about what's good in their diet, especially when they're going to the grocery stores. And a lot of times the patients, um, they can't, uh, that's why we need to make sure that we teach our patients about good dieting habits. And a lot of times when patients are at the grocery stores, um, if they're on a, a food uh, allowance or something like that, you wanna make sure that you teach your patients to parameter shop. And parameter shop means that everything on the outside of the grocery stores, if you've ever been into a grocery store, you need to take the opportunity to look. When you first walk into the grocery stores, to the right is usually the vegetables. Down past the vegetables, straight ahead is the meats. And then down past the meats is usually um, the, the, the uh, dairy products and things that's good for you. The problem when you start having bad foods is when you start going up and down the aisles. So one thing you want to do is make sure we teach our patients good health eating habits, especially if they have uh, problems with fluid volume deficits especially if they have congested heart failure, you wanna make sure that you teach the patients good um, eating habits, that's very important. So remember, parameter shopping, teach them parameter shopping. Fluid volume excess, um, nursing management, you want to make sure that we check the intake and output just like with fluid volume deficit. Um, a daily weight, we need to make sure we weigh the patients daily. Assess the lung sounds. We want to make sure that there's no um, crackles or any type of fluid subnormal listenings when we're listening to the lung sounds. We want to make sure that the patient's lungs are clear. That could always indicate that the patient may have a fluid volume overload. Edema is another symptom of a, that a patient may have if they have a fluid volume excess. So we want to make sure that we check the patient's extremities for edema. Monitor responses to medications such as diuretics and IV fluids. So when we give a patient um, IV fluids and we see that this patient is 
Uh, we're giving them diuretics, but they're not putting out anything, but they have a fluid volume overload. You wanna make sure that you notify the physician because sometimes a patient who um, we're giving Lasix and everything to and um, any type of other diuretics, but they're not putting out anything, sometimes the patient may have to have a little bump of something like albumin to help them get that fluids from the uh, extracellular to the intracellular tissue. So make sure you keep that in mind when we're talking about the fluid volume excess. Just because you give a patient a diuretic does not mean that they're going to expel the, the excess of fluids. So we may have to give them a little extra to go along with the fluids or the volume of fluids using sodium, which is, would be the choice would be albumin. So make sure you take and keep that in mind. Promote adherence to fluid restrictions. If a patient has a fluid volume excess, make sure they know that we need to have a fluid restriction because we don't want the patient to get volume overload. So if a patient has an excess, we don't wanna give them too much more. So we have to put them on a fluid restriction and that restriction needs to be monitored very carefully. And I want you to remember that when we're talking about a fluid volume excess, we're not just talking about the things that they drink. So if we have a patient who's on a fluid restriction and we say that they, they're on a 1500 fluid restriction and we're going to give them 500 cc's of drink from eight to uh, four in the afternoon, we need to also account for any type of IV fluids that that patient may be taking in because that counts as part of their intake. So we want to make sure that we count correctly the fluid that they take in, whether it is by mouth or parental or whatever, you want to make sure that that is accounted for. Monitor and avoid sources of excessive sodium, including medications. So if a patient um, has a fluid volume excess, we want to make sure they have a decrease in amount of sodium they take in, whether it's in food, whether it's in medications, or what have you. They need to make sure that they have a right amount of sodium, because remember, uh, water will follow salt. And you want to also make sure that we promote rest for the patient. Electrolyte imbalances. So here we're talking about sodium. If it's low sodium, we call that hyponatremia. If it's sodium too high, we call that hypernatremia. And remember, if a patient has a sodium, that is low, we want to have a fluid restriction for that patient. If a patient has a sodium that is high, then we want to make sure that we give that patient fluid because that can be a sign and symptom and most often of dehydration. So just because they have a high sodium does not mean, oh, they've been drinking a lot. So you have to remember high sodium, hypernatremia means dehydration. Potassium. If you have a low potassium, hypokalemia, that means if, if the normal rate is 3.5 to 4.5, and we have a patient who has a potassium of about 2.5, then that's low. We need to give that patient a potassium supplement, whether it's oral or IV. And remember, if you give a patient IV potassium, it is very, it burns, it's very caustic to the veins. So make sure that you remember that. If a patient has potassium that's too high, greater than 4.5, then a lot of times that patient can start having problems, especially with their heart. So hyperkalemia means, you know, they have, they have uh, a potassium higher than uh, 4.55, 6, 7, hyperkalemia. You want to make sure that we know what the gold standard treatment is for hyperkalemia. And the gold standard treatment for hyperkalemia that you might see in the hospital is a patient may take a medication called k exalate k exalate is a medication that the patient will drink. And what will happen? The patient will start having diarrhea or loose stools and it will start bringing down the patient's potassium level. If a patient is symptomatic and is severely symptomatic or maybe the patient has kidney injuries or kidney failure and they're starting to have some arrhythmias, some problems with their heart, then you may see the patient taking a couple of things. They may have k -exalate, they may have sodium bicarbonate, which is another treatment for a patient with hyperkalemia. You may see the patient um, taking medications such as albuterol. Albuterol, they have a high dose of albuterol given to the patients and they call that the hyperkalemia dose of albuterol. 
you may see the patient take insulin IV. And remember, the only insulin that we give in the IV right now is regular insulin. So if you give a patient regular insulin and it causes their potassium to come down, make sure if a patient happens to be on an insulin drip, that that is one of the things that you want to monitor in your renal panel is um, hypokalemia. So remember, we treat hyperkalemia with kaexalate, insulin IV, sodium bicarbonate, and um, some uh, albuterol high doses. So just keep that in mind. Calcium, a patient who has hypocalcemia, low calcium, again, we will give a patient a calcium supplement. If a patient has an increase of calcium, hypercalcemia, uh, we will give patients a treatment for that as well. And make sure that you know that sometimes what are some of the indicators for patients who are high in hypercalcemia who has high calcium. That can be an indicator for um, a cancer or a cancer marker. So keep that in mind. And some of the medications that you might see a patient taking who has high calcium may be a drug called calcitonin. So make sure that you know that drug as well. Phosphorus, a patient who has a low phosphorus is hypophosphatemia, high phosphorus is hyperphosph high, hyperphosphatemia. And remember that most of the time, those patients are patients who have some kidney injuries or on renal, um, renal, renal dialysis or things, or have some type of renal impairment. Chloride, hypochloremia and hyperchloremia are some of the uh, electrolyte imbalances that you might see in a patient. Hyponatremia. So we've talked about hyponatremia, sodium less than 135. That's the definition for hypernatremia. It's acute, it can result in fluid volume overload of a surgical patient, um, chronic seen over time outside the hospital. It's a longer duration and it's a little less serious. And you can start seeing some neurological sequelae. Um, Exercise associated more common in women with small stature and extreme temperatures, um, excessive fluid intake and prolonged exercise. So those are some of the people who are running and exercising quite a bit, some of our athletes. Causes and clinical manifestations. Causes of imbalance of water losses due to vomiting, diarrhea, um, sweating, diuretics, adrenal insufficiencies, certain medications. And remember earlier, we talked about SIADH. This can cause um, the patient to have some clinical manifestations of their sodium. Manifestations also include poor skin tugger, um, dry mucosa, headaches, decrease in salivary glands, decrease in blood pressure, um, nausea, abdominal cramping, and neurological changes. The patient becomes confused. Management of hyponatremia. We will want to give the patient uh, a sodium replacement, but first make sure that you treat the underlying cause. Why are these patients having uh, sodium that is that low? Um, water restriction. So remember, we talked about that again. If a patient is hyponatremic, you want to restrict the water assessment. Make sure that we monitor the intake and the output. We want to make sure that we know um, that how much the patient is taking in and how much the patient is putting out. Encourage dietary sodium. Sometimes you may see the little sodium tabs. Monitor fluid intake. Effects of medications such as diuretics and the drug lithium. Hypernutremia. Cerium sodium greater than 145 milliequivalents. Occurs in patients with normal fluid volumes, fluid volume deficits, or fluid volume excess. Most effective are very old, very young, and cognitively impaired patients. Causes of clinical manifestations, the causes of fluid um, deprivation, excess sodium, um, administration of diabetes insipidus, we talked about that, um, heat strokes, hypertonic IV fluids, um, IV solutions, and sometimes you can give a patient um, IV fluids that can cause a patient to become very dry and thirsty. And one of these uh, things that I would like for you all to look at one day is called the Josie story. And the Josie story talks about um, the, the child who had sustained burns uh, 
in the hospital and she was getting morphine and fluids and things of that nature. And um, her mom had went to see her in the PICU and they moved her down to a regular unit. And she noticed that when she was given Josie a bath that she wanted to drink a lot of water. And um, the nurse was saying, hey, you know, it's okay. But mom was like, this is not normal for her to suck on the bath off in the bath rag and things. And so she wanted it checked, but no one listened to her. And she went home. And after she went home, Josie ended up going into cardiac arrest um, because she did have some fluid volume depletion and she passed away. So the Josie story is a good example of um, clinical manifestations when you think a person is just wanting to drink and drink and drink and drink large volumes. You want to make sure that you monitor the patient's renal panel. Manifestations, thirst and elevated temperatures. Management of hypernutremia. So gradual lower the sodium level via infusion of hypotonic electrolyte infusions is great. Diuretics, assessment for abnormal loss of water and low water intake. So remember, if you have a patient who's hypernatremic, um, we want to make sure that we give them fluids and things because they're probably dry. Assess for the over-the-counter sources of sodium and monitor for central nervous system changes. Um, hypokalemia, the, below 3.5, we want to make sure that we give them a sodium replacement, and we've talked about that already. Causes and clinical manifestations can include GI loss, um, medications, prolonged intestinal suctioning, recent ileostomy, tumor of the intestines, alterations of acid-base balance, poor dietary intake, hyperaldosteronism, uh, manifestations. You may see an ECG change in that patient. Dysrhythmias, you may see diluted urine, excessive thirst, um, fatigue, anorexia, muscle weaknesses, decreased bowel motility, and parathesia. Management of hypokalemia, um, I'm sorry, hypokalemia, Potassium replacement. So you want to make sure that we give a potassium replacement. And remember we talked about oral IV. Um, you want to make sure that you monitor the patient if they're getting an IV, uh, IV potassium burn. Monitor ECG changes. You may want to monitor an ABG. Monitor patients receiving digitalis of toxicity drugs. Monitor for early signs and symptoms of ECG changes. Um, administer IV potassium only after adequate urine output has been established. Hyperkalemia, serum potassium greater than 5.0 seldom occurs in patients with normal renal, renal functions, but most often occurs in patients who are, have some renal impairments. Increased risk in older adults and cardiac arrest uh, may be associated with hyperkalemia. Causes and clinical manifestations, the causes, impaired renal functions, rapid administrations of potassium, hypoaldosteronism, uh, medications, tissue trauma, and acidosis. Manifestations, cardiac changes, um, dysrhythmias, muscle weaknesses, parathesia, anxieties, and GI manifestations. What is the management for the potassium? We talked about that earlier in the video. Monitor ECG, assess labs, which will be in your renal panel. Um, monitor intake and output. Obtain an apical pus, because remember, we were talking about cardiac changes. Limitation of dietary potassium and dietary supplements. If a patient is having hyperkalemia because of renal functions, there are two diets that sometimes a patient may go on who are renal patients it may be 60 grams of a renal diet or 100 grams if a patient is actively on dialysis you may see the patient on a 100 gram um, a renal diet which is basically a potassium sparing diet emergent care iv calcium gluconate iv sodium bicarbonate iv regular insulin hypertonic dextrose, a beta-2 agonist, dialysis, and administer an IV slow and with an infusion pump. And a lot of times we give the dextrose because we have to give the 
um, insulin IV, which can drop the patient's blood sugar. So in terms, we give them back the dextrose. Hypocalcemia. The serum level less than 8.6 must be considered in conjunction with serum albumin levels. So if you have one problem with uh, one thing in the body or one electrolyte such as um, calcium, then you want to make sure that we've checked or the physician has checked an albumin level because albumin levels and the calcium levels go hand in hand. And we talked and I've talked about albumin a lot. And I've talked about albumin when we're talking about pulling fluids from the extracellular to the intracellular tissues, getting it out through the kidneys. So make sure that you know that the albumin level in the body is very important. Now, a lot of times when you see albumin levels in the body, in the blood that you see in the hospital, that is identifying the albumin in the blood volume. But when you're talking about pre-albumin, we are usually talking about if a patient has a deficiency in food intake, if they are malnourished. So make sure you know when we're talking about the albumin level and the pre-albumin level, they can indicate that the patient has some uh, malnourishments. Serum calcium levels controlled by the parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. And remember, I talked about the drug calcitonin earlier. And that is some of the things that you may see on your exam, um, calcitonin, and some of the other drugs that you may see on your exam are Lasix, uh, k -exalate, some of those drugs. So make sure that you study and make note of that. Causes and clinical manifestations. Causes of hypoparathyroidism, malabsorption of osteoporosis, um, pancreatitis, alkalosis, transfusion of citrated blood, kidney injury, and medica med uh, medications. Some of the manifestations of problems that you might see is tetany, um, sacromoral numbness, and paresthesia, hyperactive DTRs, true south sound signs, the true south signs, uh, check tech signs, seizures, respiratory symptoms, shortness of breath, laryngeal spasms, abnormal clotting, and some anxieties. Management of hypocalcemia, you will see the patient uh, take IV calcium gluconate for emergency situations, seizure precautions, oral calcium and vitamin D supplements. So remember, we give one thing and they work together. So vitamin D and oral calcium. And a lot of times you may see patients on vitamin D, especially if there are older patients um, in units. If you want to tell a patient how to increase their vitamin D as well, make sure they know that they can go outside and sit in the sun. That helps to increase the vitamin D in the body. Exercise to decrease bone calcium loss and patient teaching related to diets and medications. The true soft sign, it shows you here a picture of the true soft signs. Hypercalcemia, serum level greater than 10.2 milligrams per deciliter. Hypercalcemia crisis has the high of the mortality rate. Causes are malignancies, and remember I said early in the videos, sometimes if a patient has an increase in calcium, it could be an indicator of, of cancer or a malignancy of some sort. Manifestations of polyuria, thirst, muscle weaknesses, intractable nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, severe constipation and diarrhea, peptic ulcer, bone pain, ECG chains, and changes and dysrhythmias. Treat the underlying cause. Why does this patient have hypercalcemia? Administer IV fluids such as furosemide, phosphate, calcitonin, uh, biphosphates, increase mobility, encourage fluids, dietary teaching, fiber for constipation, and ensure safety. Hypomagnesium. Serum levels less than 1.3 milligrams per deciliter um, associated with hypokalemia. So here we have the magnesium associated with the hypokalemia. Um, and you will see that the electrolytes will marry each other periodically. 
Hypokalemia and hypocalcemia goes with hypomagnesium. So if you see a patient who has a low potassium and they have a low calcium, um, you want to make sure that we're checking a magnesium level. Causes can be alcoholism, it could be GI losses, internal or parental feeding deficiencies, um, and magnesium medications, rapid administration of citrated blood. The manifestations are some of the signs that you may see a patient with hypomag uh, hypomagnesium as ch chest ache, intrusal signs, apathy, depressed mood, psychosis, neuromuscular irritability, muscle weakness, tremors, ECG changes, and dysrhythmias. The management of hypomagnesium. Magnesium will be given um, IV. Oral magnesium may be given. Monitor for dysphagia, seizure precautions, and dietary teaching. Hypermagnesium, serial level greater than 3.0. Rare electrolyte abnormality because of the kidneys insufficient excrete magnesium. Causes can be kidney injury, diabetic ketoacidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, excessive administration of magnesium, extensive soft tissue injury, manifestations of hypoactive reflexes, drowsiness, muscle weaknesses, depressed respirations, ECG changes, dysrhythmias, and the patient may go into cardiac arrest. Management of hypermagnesium. Again, the patient may receive IV calcium gluconate, dialysis, administration of a loop diuretic, sodium chloride, and lactated ringers. Avoid medications containing magnesium. Patients teaching regarding of magnesium containing over-the-counter medications is important. Make sure that when we're doing a physical assessment that we're looking at the deep tendon reflexes of the patients and any type of changes in their level of consciousness. Hypophosphatemia, serum levels below 2.5. Again, the causes may be alcoholism, refeeding of patients after starvation, pain, heat stroke, respiratory alkalosis, hyperventilation, diabetic ketoacidosis, hepatic encephalopathy, major burns, hypoparathism, low magnesium, low potassium, diarrhea, vitamin D deficiency, the use of diuretics and antacids, the manifestations, neurological symptoms, confusion, muscle weakness, tissue, tissue hypoxia, muscle and bone pain, increased susceptibility to infection, medical management, oral or IV phosphorus replacement, nursing management assessment and encouraged foods high in phosphorus, gradually introduce calories for the malnourished patients receiving parental nutrition. So make sure that we look at a patient's nutrition factors when, talk, when we're talking about um, the, hypopho the phosphorus and things of that nature. Hyperphosphate, serum level above 4.5. Remember I talked about some of the causes could be patients who are on dialysis or who has had a kidney injury. Excessive phosphorus, excessive vitamin D, acidosis, hypoparathyroidism, chemotherapy. Manifestations, few symptoms, soft tissue calcification symptoms occur due to associated hypocalcemia. Medical management, treat the underlying disorder. What's the problem? Vitamin D preparations, calcium binding, antacids. Phosphate binding, gels and antacids. Loop diuretics, normal saline IV and dialysis. Nursing management, assessment, avoid high phosphorus foods. Patient teacher related to diet, phosphate containing substances. And what are the signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia? Or, uh, because remember, the hypocalcemia and the phosphorus goes together. Hypochloremia, serum level less than 97 milliequivalents or milliequivalents. Causes is Addison disease, reduced chloride intake, GI loss, DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis, excessive sweating, fever, burns, medications, and metabolic alkalosis, 
Loss of chloride occurs when a loss of other electrolytes such as potassium and sodium is lost. The manifestations are the patient may become agitated, irritable, weak, hyperexcitable of muscles, dysrhythmias, seizures, and comas may occur. The medical management is replacing the chloride via IV using normal saline or 0.45 of IV fluids, which is half normal saline. Nursing management is good assessment. Avoid free water. Include or encourage high chloride foods. Patient teaching related to high chloride foods as well. Hypokaremia, serum levels more than 107. Causes or excessive sodium chloride infusion with water loss, head injury, hypernatremia, dehydration, severe diarrhea, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, hypoparathyroidism, medications, manifestations, tachypnea, lethargy, weakness, rapid deep respiration, hypertension, cognitive changes normal serum anion gap, medical management, restore the electrolyte or the fluid balance. Lactated ringers may be given, sodium bicarbonate, diuretics, nursing management assessment, patient teaching related to the diet and hydration of the patient. Maintaining an acid-base balance. Normal plasma is 7.345 to 4. Point, excuse me. Normal plasma pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Hydrogen ion concentration. If we were talking about a patient and we were talking about the patient's arterial blood gas, one of the things that we will look at is what is the pH in the body. 7. 3.5 to 7.45 is normal. 7.35 or less is low. 7.45 is high. And the major extracellular fluid buffer systems, bicarbonate, carbonic acid buffer systems are used. Kidneys regulate bicarbonate in ECF. Lungs under control of the medulla regulates the CO2 and thus the carbonic acid or extracellular fluids or ECF is monitored or released. Other buffer systems, ECF, inorganic phosphates, plasmas and proteins, ICF, proteins, organic, inorganic phosphates and hemoglobin, a low pH, Less than 7.35 means the patient is acidotic. Less than 7.35, low bicarbonate. A patient has less than 22 milliequivalents, most commonly due to kidney injuries. Some of the manifestations that you will see this patient have is headache, confusion, drowsiness, increased respiratory rate and depth, decreased blood pressure, decreased cardiac output, dysrhythmias, shock, if decreased, um, cardiac output, dysrhythmia the shock, if decreased is slow, patients may be asymptomatic into bicarbonate reach around 15 or less. Correct under, uh, the underlying problem, correct the imbalance. Bicarbonate may be administered. Metabolic acidosis. With acidosis, hyperkalemia may occur as potassium shifts out of the cell. As acidosis is corrected, the potassium shifts back into the cell and the potassium levels decrease. Monitor the patient's potassium level. Serium calcium levels may be low with chronic metabolic acidosis. Most must be corrected before treating the acidosis. So you want to make sure that we um, take care of the serium calcium levels in the body. Metabolic alkalosis greater than 7.45, that's the pH of the blood. High bicarbonate, greater than 26. Most common due to vomiting and or gastric suctioning. Med may also be due to medications, especially long-term diuretic use. Hypokalemia, 
will produce alkalosis, manifestation, symptoms related to decreased calcium, respiratory depression, tachycardia, symptoms of hypokalemia. That's why when we're talking about a patient, when we're talking about the ABGs, arterial blood gas, if a patient has large volume, volumes of diarrhea or vomiting and they have a pH greater than 7.45 and they have a bicarbonate greater than 26, a lot of times we will say this is a metabolic issue versus a respiratory issue. So when we're talking about the ABG, the ABG will determine depending on the pH, the bicarbonate, the PCO2 of the body, whether this is respiratory or metabolic, if it's a metabolic issue. So metabolic alkalosis corrects underlying disorder. Why does the patient throw up? Why is the patient having diarrhea? We need to correct those problems to make sure that we can get the metabolic alkalosis control. Supply chloride to allow excretion of excess of bicarbonate, restore fluid volume with sodium chloride solution. Respiratory alkalosis, respiratory acidosis. Patient has a pH less than 7.35. The patient is deemed to have acidosis. If the PACO2 is uh, less than uh, greater than 42, then it will say that this patient has some respiratory um, acidosis. And remember, we use the PACO2 with our pH to determine, the PACO2 will determine if it's respiratory or metabolic. If it's, if it's uh, metabolic, we're talking about the bicarbonate. If it's respiratory, we're talking about the PACO2. Always due to respiratory problems with inadequate excretion of CO2. So when you're looking at your ABG and make sure that you know your ABGs, that you know that the pH normal range is 7.35 to 7.45. PACO2, PACO2 is relating to respiratory. And if we're talking about the bicarb in the ABG, then we're talking about metabolic. With chronic respiratory acidosis, body may compensate and the patient may be asymptomatic because the creator of this body is a genius. So when the body starts having problems, then the creator of this bottom knows that things starts to compensate. So some people can walk around with low pH, high PCO2s, low PCO2s, and you never have a problem. You take the ABG and you're like, oh my God, they need to be put on a ventilator. But this patient's body has compensated so long that they don't have a problem. But when they finally get into trouble, they're in bad trouble. Symptoms may include suddenly increase in pulse, respirations, BP, mental changes, and feeling fullness in their head. Respiratory acidosis, potential increase in intracranial pressure. Treatment is aimed to improve in ventilation. Respiratory alkalosis is the pH is greater than 7.45 and the PACO2, PACO2 is less than 35, always due to hyperventilation. So if your patient is hyperventilating and if you was taking an ABG on this patient, you probably will see an increase in the pH and a decrease in the PACO2. Always due to hyperventilation manifestations may be lightheadedness, inability to concentrate, numbness and tingling, sometimes loss of consciousness, and you want to correct the cause of the hyperventilation. Here's your arterial blood gas. And again, we talked about the arterial blood glass, blood gas. The pH is 7.35 to 7.45. PACO2 is 35 to 45. The bicarbonate, which is the HCO3, is 22 to 26. Assume average values for ABG interpretations. The PaO2, which is the oxygen level in the blood, is 80 to 100. Oxygen saturation is uh, greater than 94. And the base excess deficit is plus minus 2 million equivalents per, per uh, deciliter. So make sure that you know your ABGs for your testing. So testing ABGs will be on your exam. All right, if you have any other questions, uh, let me know. Uh, we will be talking about fluid volume deficit. Make sure that you include the information that you know about your renal panel, CBC, which I talked about. Make sure that you know your ABCs. Thank you guys for letting me record this. I would like to get you some feedback.
Let me know if you think this is uh, good for you guys.